Hartford together. And that begins tonight. To fix all these places. The port. They both got a great that they are focused on. Essential strategies for aging care needs. So um, she had a personal experience, which she's going to share, which got her into this and helped her become really passionate. But she had all the credentials to begin with. She had been a nurse. She's a um, certified care manager. But I guess what happened was that crisis brought out her entrepreneurial spirit. So she created a really great resource. And her team is pretty exceptional. Um, Jennifer has been very involved in the community. Just a little bit of background, which you might have seen. She's a member of the Aging Life Care Association, Home Care Association of America, Washington Home Care Association, Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce, Spokane Estate Planning Council, um, National Association for Women Business Owners, Northwest Chapter. She was a board member there. So very involved in our community. And we have been trying to get her up here for some time. And we even brought the cameras, because that's important enough message that she's being recorded on. Please help me provide a warm welcome to Jennifer Ama. Thanks for the warm welcome, PJ. All right. So I always like to start out with a little bit about my background beyond the uh, unexciting details of my years in healthcare. Um, I've been in healthcare for over 25 years now. Um, but where I really got my start and my love is from my own personal story. And that was working with, um, or not working with, but an experience with my own family member. Um, my grandma in her early 70s was diagnosed with a dementia after being hospitalized for a very serious infection. And she was really lucky to live through that hospitalization. But unfortunately, she returned home and the challenges started cropping up immediately. There were safety issues galore, and um, we knew it was not safe to keep her there any longer. My family um, made the hard decision of what to do next, and they decided to bring Grandma into our home. And so as a youth, and I was about 11, 10, 11 years old at the time, I got to experience caring for a family member, and she needed someone around the clock to provide care for her. And so we did that as a family. And um, I loved having grandma in our home right there with me, but it was also challenging. And my family, um, we had sacrifices we had to make. Um, and that's what families are dealing with every day. I think that experience and grandma ended up, um, you know, ended up eventually living in a memory care facility as her needs got greater and she started to wander at night and that type of thing. Um, so I got kind of that whole spectrum and to see all those levels. Um, and I went on to become a nurse's aide while I was going through um, my nursing school and worked in retirement communities and skilled nursing facilities. And once I became a nurse, I worked in the hospital setting in acute care. But then in 2005, I had the opportunity to get back to the work I love, and that really feeds me. And that's helping people in their aging journey and finding solutions and making that um, the best path possible for people. So the issues, just like I shared with you regarding my family, they're, they're complex and they're great. There's over 70 million Americans right now taking care of a family member. Um, it might be increased frailty or a declining ability. Sometimes it starts out really small. It's, you know, the inability to keep up the home as easily as they once did. Um, maybe driving's becoming concerning. Uh, it could be something very small into their care needs aren't being met. All of a sudden, you kind of see signs that they're not maybe taking care of themselves, getting showers. Maybe they're wearing the same clothes each time you go to the house for a week. Um, another big area is medication management. The mismanagement of medication is one of the number one reasons for a fall. It is also a leading cause of hospitalizations and rehospitalizations. So getting a handle on what medication someone should be taking. Um, in addition, there are all the family dynamic issues that go along with caring for a family member. Grief, depression, 
um, other mental health issues. I was talking with someone earlier who was sharing, um, you know, details about how challenging it can be to watch a loved one age and go through a health decline. How um, stressful and burdensome that can be and how alone you can feel oftentimes in that situation. So really getting some support out for those family caregivers as well as the person who's faced with the illness or the decline in health. And so um, this is where licensed mental health counseling comes in. I see a lot in healthcare that people going through depression and grief issues, they're oftentimes medicated. You know, they're written a prescription by their doctor for depression but we don't always look at that, that other side of things. What else do we need to offer as supports to them? Um, there's some really great programs in our Spokane area. One of them, I don't know if you're familiar, is called the um, Family Caregiver Support Program. And this is a program that's a granted uh, program, and it's designed to help individuals be able to um, stay in their um, capacity of caring for their family member. And so if we can support them with some services, and this means free respite care, so that they can have a break outside the home, you know, get some things done and know their loved one's taken care of, this licensed counseling. And this is for them, actually. This is because oftentimes it's a family caregiver, your needs aren't addressed. So this addresses their needs as well. So there's some wonderful supports out there um, in that area. In addition, um, I always like to talk about the kind of trajectory of care needs and what happens. So Barron's had an article back in 2018 that I thought was great because it talked a lot about the fact that in the beginning, families and individuals support say, you know, we've got this. Things are going really well. well. There's not a whole lot, you know, my loved one needs. Um, you know, I might have to take mom or dad out to get some medical tests done, you know, to go to a few appointments. I might have to fly down a weekend or two to help them get settled in a new retirement community, but things are going pretty good. Well, the truth is, is usually there's a little more to that picture that hasn't been fully uncovered, and maybe it is going pretty good, but that's, you know, kind of the start of a slippery slope down. And before you know it, uh, needs are cropping up, it means time off, time away from work. Things that once were manageable, all of a sudden really aren't. And trying to go it alone becomes um, pretty confusing and challenging. So ends up being that instead of uh, being at a state where things are very easy and manageable, we're all of a sudden having family issues crop up. Um, dynamics within the family because things have become so stressful. It might mean, I see this a lot for individuals, their retirement plans for themselves being upended. You know, things are changing. Hey, I thought I was going to spend my retirement years, you know, traveling and enjoying, and I'm, you know, stuck here being a full-time, you know, care or help for my parents. So whatever it might be, um, it is, can be very burdensome. To top it off, we're a mobile society. People, uh, this study was done recently, I thought it was really interesting. They found that adults who are uh, over the age of 60, on average, live over 280 miles from their nearest child. So you imagine all those complexities and challenges of caring for a family member, um, and then you put distance on top of that. You know, just last week I met with a woman who was from Colorado. She worked in the financial industry there. And she had, was in Spokane for her third time in a four-month period. Her mom had had a major health decline. She'd been in, in the hospital twice. She was on her second hospitalization when I met with her. And she was at the point, the daughter, that she knew if I don't get some support and help, I'm going to potentially lose my job. I can't keep going this way. And she was the closest family member to her mom. And so getting that extra support, um, I think will make all the difference for her. I like these stats because I think uh, they really paint the picture of how challenging this can be. Um, just like this daughter who was at, her, at the end of her rope, they found that 60% of family caregivers work full time. And of those, the vast majority have to make accommodations to be able to 
provide that care. And when I say care, keep in mind, I don't always mean hands-on care. This can be the, I've got to go twice a week to fill mom's medication box. Or maybe I'm going to um, drive her dad to a medical appointment. Um, so it doesn't have to be significant care, but all those pieces add up. Maybe I call every day to check in, and when mom or dad doesn't answer, I'm really nervous, and then I decide to drive across town 40 minutes there and back to, to make sure they're okay. So whatever that might be. So 61% of these people in the workforce are making accommodations. This is taking, exhausting all their time off benefits to provide care, sometimes having to go on a leave, getting passed up or turning down a promotion. So it can be um, quite uh, mind boggling to their future. 70% uh, of family caregivers report signs and symptoms of depression related to their caregiving responsibilities. So that's major. Um, and in addition, we often see that a phenomena where the family caregiver, and I see this mostly with spouses, they stop taking care of themselves in the process of caring for their loved one. So they are putting their full energy and heart and soul into caring for their ill spouse, but all of a sudden they're not getting good nutrition for themselves, exercise, or even more significantly, they're not getting out to medical appointments because it's too challenging or they're worried about leaving their loved one home. Um, so whatever it might be, all of a sudden issues are cropping up with their own health and it's hard to be a good caregiver when you've got issues, health issues that you're facing. So 50% were found to report some type of pain daily related to their caregiving duties and 25% a worsening of heart conditions. So it's, a, it's definitely a slippery slope. So why build a care team? Well, a care team is going to not only address the challenges, but make sure that we're getting the supports in place and a plan in place to curve some of the crises and the issues that are gonna crop up along the way. Um, if we can be proactive, and I preach proactivity a lot, I know it's hard, I'm not always proactive in my life about things, Long-term care and planning for aging isn't one of the most glamorous things to plan for, so I think a lot of us put off looking at that. But if we can plan, um, the future is certainly brighter than it would be without. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about a three-pronged approach to some different services that I think can make a huge difference in this planning process. So the first is uh, professional geriatric care management. And just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of professional geriatric care management? It's a mouthful. Okay, so probably a third to two, you know, a half of the room. Um, this service or industry per se started in the 80s. It's still fairly unknown out there. So I like to be able to share a little bit. Um, Geriatric care managers are registered nurses and medical social workers who are specially trained in aging issues. And uh, they are acting always as a guide or an advocate for individuals. Home care is the next area. Home care services are those provided by a home care aide or a certified nurse's aide who are going out into the home to deliver day-to-day -day type services. These are services that are generally private in nature. Unfortunately, Medicare does not cover the vast majority of long-term care needs, whether that be in home, facility, um, or nursing home. Um, so that's home care, and they really can be delivered anywhere from a few hours a week to 24 hour around the clock, like end of life care. So there's a huge variety depending on need. And then the next one is licensed counseling. And I made mention of that earlier, but it's so important to support individuals going through um, facing aging alone and the changes that they have dealt with not only in themselves, but seeing family members pass away and um, you know the loss they've had to deal with. It's really important to get counseling to them and being able to bring that into the home through this service is really amazing for those who can't get who may be homebound and can't get out to see a counselor. So when we look at why would th these services be needed and why would geriatric care management specifically be needed? Well, think of a geriatric, 
geriatric care manager as a coach or a leader. Kind of sometimes people say they're like quarterback. Um, they're going to be responsible for designing and laying out a plan um, for this aging spectrum. And to do that, the first step is always to do a very thorough assessment. This is a set assessment of medical, cognition, mental health issues, medications, family supports, you know, what resources and services do they have in place today, and how can we um, envelop as much resources and wrap around this person as possible to make this the best situation possible. I think a care manager comes in very handy when we've got distance family members or family who are just overburdened with the day-to-day -day care. Uh, I think it could be very useful for someone who's isolated and doesn't have um, maybe no living relatives or they're estranged from their family. We see that a lot. Um, oftentimes, a care manager gets involved when there are strained family relationships. Let's face it. Dealing with care for a loved one is stressful for everyone. So oftentimes there can be huge disagreements among family members about what should be done. And um, you see this when maybe one family member is more involved and so they have some insight that other family who may be at a distance or not as actively involved don't see. So those disagreements break out and put a lot of strain on that family unit. So great time to get a third party, you know, unbiased professional involved to kind of mediate those issues. Um, I know because we only have one PowerPoint today, this is really far back for some of you. So I'm, I'm just gonna briefly like read what's on this, but this is the eight areas of expertise of a um, geriatric care manager. And um, with this, these areas, um, the first one is health and disability. The next is financial, and um, then we've got housing, which uh, is looking at um, the best housing options, whether that's bringing care in the home or looking at placement in a community care facility. Family, I just talked about, local resources, advocacy, and legal. And so care managers aren't uh, legal professionals, nor are they financial advisors, but they recognize the needs that surround. Have, have you asked, do you or your loved one have an up-to-date power of attorney for health care and financial? How about a health care directive that outlines your wishes? Um, do you have a post form which outlines your wishes in the case of an emergency? So these are things that, you know, estate plans and we're able to recognize and make recommendations for that next step. I think one thing I want to mention here, down in the bottom right corner, Aging Life Care Association. I get this question a lot, so I'm going to beat you to it. Sometimes um, people hear me present on the Aging Life Care and they say, you know what, my parent lives in Florida. I really would love to have some help like this for them there. How would I find this? That is a website that you can go to that has a find an expert you know, um, search engine. And you can put in zip code, city, whatever it might be, and find a professional geriatric care manager who has gone through the certifications and training um, and be rest assured that there might be somebody in your loved one's city who can um, provide this valuable service. So I never fail to be amazed that people, when they come to meet with us and work with us, there's still a very little um, knowledge about the costs that are associated with um, long-term care. And probably 80% of the time we get the question, doesn't Medicare cover all of this? And no, <laughs> unfortunately not. Uh, Medicare covers hospitalizations and acute care, but the long-term care that so many of us will need during our lifetimes is not covered by Medicare. Um, and so I wanted to put a slide up. This study is um, done by Genworth every year, and um, Genworth is a long-term care insurance uh, provider, um, and insurance provider. And they um, do this by region, which is really great. So you can actually go to Genworth um, study as well and look for any city if you want to see costs in a different city. So this is Spokane for 2019. And I'm not sure how the little button works. But left side there, 
Home care is the first. So the average for home care in the Spokane area right now is $2,600 a month. Now I say $2,600, that is for 20 hours of service a week. We've kind of found that generally that's the average amount of care that's needed, um, at least until things become more significant. So $2,600 a month for home care. The next is assisted living facility. It's on the bottom half there. Top is adult day health. Assisted living is $4,000 um, per month at a base charge. Now when I say base charge, assisted living facilities and most facilities, they require a, um, they have a base charge for room and board. And then on top of that, the individual moving in is assessed to find out what their care needs are. And depending what type of care they need, they oftentimes will have either a level or added dollars on to that base charge. So it's likely higher than 4,000 per month. <clears throat> The next area is um, a private room and a nursing facility and a semi-private room. So most people who are paying privately um, are going to want a private room, typically. That's uh, average is $10,000 per month. And to be honest, mostly what I see is up in the eleven dollars to $12,000 range. So the costs are great. Imagining that we're gonna walk into this without a real solid plan and have the resources li lined out to pay for this is not realistic. So getting ahead of the curb and being proactive and doing a plan and including you, you, the professionals you work with, your advisors, um, in this plan is really important for um, having the best quality of life. You know, we don't want to um, age and not be in a place we really love, whether that's home or you know a retirement community we love. One thing that's left out here that I always like to mention is adult family homes. That can be another great resource. Um, I don't know how familiar you are, but an adult family home is a smaller residential care facility that can serve um, six or less residents. And it's a more intimate atmosphere, but you can still get a high level of care. And their average, <clears throat> this is based on my information because unfortunately Genworth doesn't put it, but I'm gonna say it's probably between 6,000 and 6,500 from my experience on average um, for an adult family home. There are probably 200-ish facilities between re retirement communities, adult family homes, nursing homes, a lot of options. So when it comes time to look at you know, whether it's bringing services in the home or, gosh, do I wanna start looking at when I'm ready to make that next move or that move, what that might look like. So an important part of <clears throat> that plan is to make sure that we're really looking at all options and um, making sure that these are the best options, and this goes back to the assessment I talked about earlier, making sure that an assessment's been performed so that we know that when we make that move or when we bring that service in, number one, it's a safe service, it's going to meet the needs, but also that it's not just a short-term plugging a hole, because we end up doing a lot of that in elder care. Oop, I'm gonna put a Band-Aid on this, because this popped up today, instead of like really getting a thorough look at um, this long-term plan. Um, I recently, uh, it wasn't myself, but one of our team um, worked with a family member. It was actually a wife of a gentleman who had had a really sharp health decline, um, and he had Parkinson's disease. He was um, to the point where she could not get him out of his chair. He was in his recliner for two days, um, and she um, had her son come over and help him. So he did get up once in that two days, but by the second day, she just was beside herself and knew that she had to call 911. He got hospitalized. Two days later, he was ready to discharge. According, you know, They said, we don't have a medical need to keep him here. You've got to take him home. This is a time where we see the most issues crop up as a discharge from a, care, a rehab care facility, short-term rehab, or hospital. And people are very rushed in. It's time to take you know, your loved one home, but oftentimes there's very little planning and very little education as to what supports we can get in place and what resources we can get in place to help with that discharge. 
So um, she was beside herself with stress of how I'm, he's even more weak today from what I can see than he was when he came in the hospital two days ago. How am I gonna do this? And they're pushing me and saying I need to get him out today. And um, she interestingly enough called her attorney thinking well maybe the attorney can stop this from happening. And attorney referred her to us. And um, there, are, it, there are some words that I would highly recommend if you get faced with this situation or know someone who does. And that is to say this is not a safe discharge. And it does come a little with a little more push from a, a professional. But the, um, any system, healthcare system, has a responsibility to have a safe discharge plan in place. And so we um, jumped, and this is quite frequent, but in this case, we were able to get involved and pretty quickly coordinate some resources. She decided to bring him home. He hadn't been in the hospital for, if you don't know this, it's a three-day qualifying stay to be on a Medicare stay in rehab. And rehab is where you'd go for anywhere from a few weeks to a few months to get stronger and to rehabilitate. And so she had to pay privately because he hadn't had that three day stay. They opted to bring him home. We got the resources in place to make sure they had all the care they needed. Um, and so this is a situation that you wanna, again, get ahead of that. Uh, so I've touched a lot on geriatric care management. Um, that's a lot of the first step in the planning process is getting that support. So I wanna touch on um, home care services. And um, I think I'm sure a lot more of you, how many of you have heard of home care services? I bet I'll see a lot of hands, almost the whole room. Yes, so that's great. You know that there's an option. Nine out of 10 Americans when, when a Ask, say, I want to live in my own home. That's where they find their joy, that's, they're surrounded by the people they love, the things they love, and so if we can support them in that, that's wonderful. Um, so this is just a list of some of the services that a home care agency can provide. Um, I say agency because I would highly encourage the support of a professional agency. In Washington State, we have a licensing body, the Department of Health, who licenses all home care agencies. This means that they have to have um, the training, the credentials, the procedures. Uh, I encourage you to stay away from the private sector. It can, be, it can seem less expensive at first, but there are um, a lot of liability and responsibilities you take on because the person um, who engages them is, becomes their employer. And so the risks are, can be great. So um, anyway, as far as home care services go, as little as a few hours again, up until that around o'clock care, um, having the hiring, screening, background checks, you wanna make sure people are really safe to care for you or your loved one. Um, the supervision is huge. You know, a supervisor who's dropping in unannounced to make sure that mom or dad or husband or wife is really getting the care that they are designed to have, that there's no concerning behaviors happening. So just keeping a really close eye on things. This is just, the first um, page was a lot of the act, more um, hands-on type care. And then this is a little bit more of the, one important thing is let's keep people engaged in the communities. Um, if they're a Rotarian and this is what they've done for the last 50 years and all of a sudden they can't get here because of transportation or because it's really difficult to get in and out of the house, you know, physically, Let's get a caregiver to support them in that task or you know, this wonderful group um, and keep them involved in the things they know and love. Um, and just some of these other day-to-day -day tasks that can really add to quality of life. Um, so last but not least, these are just some different services that are also um, provided. And I mentioned the licensed counseling earlier, but in addition, you know, being someone's healthcare power of attorney there are um, options for that when someone doesn't have anyone else to stand in that, that role. Um, Medicaid planning, because sometimes funds get low and we have to look at the future of um, state payment for services. Um, and then just a whole lot of problem solving. So this is a really big topic. Um, I could talk for like you know a day or two about options and I would love to 
give you a lot more education than I probably was able to do in this time span today. What I really want to do is leave the last 10 minutes or so for questions so that you can really just ask me what's a burning question you might have about anything elder care. It doesn't have to be specifically about what I talked about today. We'll start with Maggie. Okay. I have to echo what you say about pre-planning. Two weeks ago today, my mother fell twice in the same day. Mm. I spent last week in California with my sister, one on the phone, one there, going through all of these steps. Boy, if we'd had this in the first place, it would have made everybody's life so much easier. Mm -hmm. How do you find, other than this um, website you gave us, how do you find these people in another community, uh, like the home health care people? Uh, she's in a hospice situation right now, which okay. is amazing. They do a lot of this work. But mm -hmm. we didn't really know who to call, so my sister, who's 11 years younger than I am, went by Yelp, which doesn't seem like a right place <laughs> to find these. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's a really good question, how to find the help. You know, I would say, being you mentioned hospice, hospice is an invaluable service. Um, hospice providers know the care agencies they've worked with. And if we're talking about home care, they know who they work with and who do a really fabulous job. They also know who they wouldn't recommend. So for you, I'd probably say, other than you know getting a care manager involved, because I do think that would be a great resource, would be to um, talk to the hospice social worker. And every patient is assigned a social worker or a case manager, and that's the person you're gonna want to ask for. They can provide a recommendation. Most times they won't just give you one, they might give you a couple, two to three agencies to consider. But I think that's a really good safe place. I would pick that any day over like a quick Google search or a Yelp review. You know, someone who really has had the hands-on experience with them. You bet. So it seems there's a lot of misunderstanding about what assisted living is all about. My understanding is that you are officially in assisted living if the organization then is responsible for your medications and your medical chart. Is that correct? Yes. Um, if someone's in assisted living, they are, so let me start here actually. Retirement communities, there can be a lot of confusion. Is this assisted? What, what is this? So you can be living in a retirement community in an apartment and be getting some great service there, but be in what's called independent living. Assisted living is when there is any management of care. So medications is one of those. It could be the management of care needs. Maybe someone needs assistance with showers because they're no longer able to do that safely. Um, any hands-on care needs is then considered assisted living. Um, in different care settings, it's a little bit different, but that's what applies for retirement communities. Does that help answer your question? Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very, very interesting and informing. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, number one, you mentioned uh, caregiving as a way of connecting people with their communities because it's healthier. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear your thoughts about how technology in the 21st century might be facilitating some of that. Mm -hmm. And then my second thing is the irony of my particular demographic, um, asking questions is not lost on me. Um, but I wanted to ask, is there anything I can do as a millennial to prepare, and what do I need to do today to be ready to be making healthy decisions in the future? Oh, good, great questions, actually. All right, so first things first, I will talk about technology. Um, we have amazing technology, as you can well imagine, um, that is so underutilized um, for aging. There are um, options to be able to communicate with your family member um, through uh, an Alexa, through multiple types of devices that are specialized in healthcare, um, and be across the country and get eyes on mom or dad. There's medication monitoring systems that are amazing that can help oftentimes, not necessarily always prevent the need for outside care, but really limit the amount. So what we've found in healthcare is that technology aids the other care delivery. And it doesn't necessarily take the place, 
but those tools can be a huge benefit. And specifically for um, keeping people connected, I think it's the platforms of um, the social media and being able to have the visuals with their family members and their loved ones that make the biggest difference. Um, and then as far as specifically planning as a younger uh, millennial or, or even someone, you know, of 50s, um, I would say get educated on the costs, number one, because we've all heard the statistics and studies about how well um, our generations have saved even those of us going a little closer into it for our, our needs for retirement and our future. So really get educated and start that plan. Um, I think financial um, professionals and advisors have some really neat planning tools that will outline the costs of care and um, work that into a retirement plan. So I think that would be my best advice as a millennial is just educate yourself and start planning for it. And same goes with um, older generations as well. Be proactive, be proactive. That's, that's the key. We plan for everything else in life, but this is one thing we have to, it's, it's not glamorous, but we just have to get it done. You bet, you bet, thank you. Thank you.